want to talk about magic items, but not just your everyday plus one longsword. I want to talk about those magic items that players covet and dream about getting their hands on. Those magic items that haunt dungeon masters in their sleep and make them want to rip their hair out. I'm talking about campaign breaking magic items and how dungeon masters and game masters can deal with them. So to start off, let's begin with a simple one that may not seem absolutely terrible at first glance, but they can still be frustrating to DMs when they are designing encounters, and that's the simple, uncommon Broom of Flying. I really love the Broom of Flying and actually very recently handed this thing out to Jim Davis of WebDM during the last season of Saber Dice, links down below. But I've seen a lot of DMs talking about the Broom of Flying on forums and social media and how frustrating it can be when designing encounters. And most of their frustration breaks down to it allows the players to skip encounters. And we're not talking about purely combat encounters either, but social, investigating encounters, and so on as well. Look, I get it. There are few things more frustrating to dungeon masters than simply having players skip to the big plot points and passing over the side story arcs because they happen to have a magic item that lets them. The stealth mission to infiltrate a mansion to access the vault in the master bedroom on the third floor during a dinner party might not carry the same weight when the player simply can use a broom of flying to zip up quickly. And a multi-troll encounter while traveling along the tradeway may not be as difficult for the party if the wizard can simply fly up out of reach of the creatures and start hurling down fireballs. So what should you do if you want to hand this thing out to your D&D group? First off, as a little side note, kind of as I go through these things, many of the tips I have for you guys will actually be applicable to several of the items on this list, not just the immediate magic item. Okay, so for dealing with a flying broom, you should make sure your party understands its limitations, specifically weight limits. The Broom of Flying already has built-in weight limits of 400 pounds and any weight over 200 pounds begins to slow the broom to just 30 feet. One of the big issues that Dungeon Masters have with this item is sort of self-inflicted like a long game of Monopoly. By house ruling that you get all the chance money when you land on free parking, you're actually creating a bigger headache for yourself. And the same principles apply here with the Flying Broom. Don't let the broom of flying be the be all end all for your group's travel. For starters, I would make sure your group understands that the broom of flying isn't going to hold several party members. There's no problem in setting the number of party members that can actually use the broom at the same time to just one medium creature or perhaps two small creatures. Remember, adventurers carry a lot of stuff with them, including the often forgotten backpack. So to avoid the argument of weight limits with any rules lawyers you guys might have at the table that will be quick to argue that weight wouldn't be an issue for their party, simply tell them that to safely travel on the broom, it can only fit one medium creature at a time due to just the bulk that they're carrying and the need to have a firm grip without actually falling off the broom. And then feel free to house rule from there based off of any decisions from your party to try and circumvent this by say dropping gear. Perhaps you want to rule that two bare bones adventurers in just their leather armor could actually ride together, but that the broom could only turn 90 degrees and around unless they both succeed an intelligence check to lean together, or maybe even an acrobatics check for the person not controlling the broom to avoid falling off. The point is not to give them a cool magic item just to put a bunch of restrictions on it, or worse yet, taken away from them, but rather to challenge them to think creatively based off of clear mechanics of the item and to keep the game a little bit better balanced, not just with your encounters, but also the balance between each of the other players at the table that don't have a broom of flying. And as one final note on the Broom of Flying, if you do want to give one of these things to your group, and I, I love it, I highly suggest that you give it a bit of a personality. Seriously, instead of just being another tool, make it a character. Make it unruly at times and cuddle at night with its owner. Or maybe even make it a little mischievous when the party camps playing little gags on them and make it terrified of fire. Maybe it can even communicate with the players by nodding or shaking its head no. And consider making its rider make animal handling checks to tame and bond with it. Just really have a lot of fun with it and double down rather than trying to wrest it away from the group because you think it might be a little bit overpowered. Next up, we have the Amulet of the Plains. But first, it's sponsor time. 
Huge shout out to Elderwood Academy for sponsoring today's video. I actually had the chance to visit the Elderwood Academy booth over at Gen Con 51. Wow, it's a lot. And, uh, and catch up with Quentin and Dan and managed to snag myself a new Codex Dice Tower for my home game. And this thing is absolutely sick. And it seriously made my brother jealous when I plopped this thing down on the table. Elderwood Academy makes some of the most stunning gaming accessories that you guys are going to find. And the best part is, is that every product they make is made to order so you can completely customize anything that they make. Right now they're actually getting ready to launch their new deck boxes for all of you card slingers out there and they've even included an insert to let you carry your dice and minis in them instead if card games aren't really your thing. Links are down below to all the stuff I just mentioned and seriously guys go check out their site it's gonna blow you away. Okay, let's talk Amulet of the Plains. The issues that Dungeon Masters have with this is understandable. The biggest problem is that when your players start bouncing around to other planes, it doesn't matter what your campaign was about. It is now a planes hopping campaign. So to summarize, this thing breaks campaigns. It just does. But the biggest issue with this item is one that I would address when handing it out to your players, and that's that the Amulet of the Plains for some reason has no limits in the number of times it can be used or how often or how fast, whatever. To me, this is the biggest problem with the item, and so I would come up with a set of rules to accompany it in how fast it can be used again. Maybe once a day or perhaps give it three charges with a 24-hour recharge of a 1D2. This isn't meant to limit the player so much as it is to give you as the DM a chance to let your players actually engage with each of these worlds that they plane hop to. It also creates a nice tiny hint of danger should they use the amulet too frequently and thus end up stuck in a place that you would not want to be stuck in until the amulet recharges, creating new sub arcs for your campaign of survival for the evening. Also, like the broom of flying, stick to the rest of the rules for this item. The players do actually need to know the places that they want to travel to first, and if they fail their initial intelligence checks, they have a chance to end up somewhere completely random. Make sure that they are aware of this danger, as a simple roll of a 1 on a d20 could have them ending up on the plane of fire. If your players want to learn about new planes and places that they could plane hop to, double down as the dungeon master and try to create fun, interesting ways for them to actually gather this information. Maybe they need to delve deep into the runes of an ancient elf sage to find a, a book describing the lost city of Tamiloth in detail before they can actually use the Amulet of the Plains to hop over and try to hunt it down. What kind of other trappings and dangers might lurk in both of those places? And as one last note dealing with this item in your campaign, I'd suggest that Dungeon Masters completely buy into it if you're gonna use it. If you have a campaign arc going when you decide to give this to your players, either understand that there is a strong possibility your players will completely ignore the current story or that your arc and villain should be adaptable if the players leave the, mo the mortal plane. And don't make it too cheesy either if you decide to go that route. It would be incredibly lame for a villain hunting down the party, watching them escape, and then immediately following them with his own equally powerful device. Hooray. But what if they spend the next two months hunting down their own amulet and don't catch up at the party until nine, 10 sessions later when the party is caught up in a completely different arc on a completely different plane. That sounds like a lot more fun than just cheesing it from the get go. Next on this list is a really tough one, the Instant Fortress. Damn, this thing is powerful. Not only is it a fortress in a box, but it can also be used to be summoned quickly and start crushing things for 10d10 damage. It's made of adamantine, it can't be tipped over, has naturally defensive arrow slits, and is totally immune to non-magical damage. Oh, and spells like a knock do diddly squat against it. Okay, so I don't think I need to go over all the stuff that actually makes those things campaign breaking for you, but let's talk about dealing with it a bit. As with all of the items here, this is not a DM versus the player scenario. That's not what we want to do. And I'd suggest that you avoid directly metagaming for it all the time. It's okay to let your players actually use it to rest. That's what it's there for. On the other hand, take into consideration where they are using it. Are intelligent enemies watching them use it or have minions reported it back to their bosses? Now you have a plot device. Maybe a Pasha from Callum Shan becomes obsessed with it and sends someone to the players to make an offer for it. When the players refuse, he ups his offer. 
When they refuse again, he becomes offended and decides to turn loose his guild of thieves and assassins for the slight against him. So I tell dungeon masters that are afraid of all the free resting with their players to look for ways to drive the campaign with the fortress and not worry about trying to sneak up on them with ambushes in the middle of the night. I mean, that is literally what this fortress is there to protect against. So just put that to the side and let those encounters kind of fade away and instead take the story elsewhere. On the other hand, using this thing as a weapon, oh boy, one action, 20 foot square, DC 15 dexterity save, 10 D 10 damage with zero limitations on uses. Damn. That's pretty tough to deal with. You have four options if your players decide to start abusing this multiple times in a combat, every single combat. First off, you can just deal with it, accept your fate, and kind of laugh along with the abuse. However, this can take a lot of the air out of campaigns where your players really enjoy the combat aspect of the game. It'll get old pretty quick. Then you can start to metagame for it if that becomes a problem. Constantly adding in air combatants and taking the stories to areas that might be a little bit too cramped for it to be used. Your second option is, is that you can damage it. While it is difficult to damage, it's not impossible. And the only way to repair it is through a wish spell. If the players are constantly using this thing as a weapon, then there's a chance that it might take some damage. This can be especially interesting if you decide to double down on the story elements that we talked about earlier. Maybe a powerful enemy hears about the item and either wants it for themselves or maybe even simply wants it destroyed due to how powerful it is and how threatened that it makes them feel. Now we can create a siege encounter, which if done right, could be an incredibly memorable fight for your group of players. Sprinkle in the fact that any damage done during the siege can only be repaired by wishes, and now your group has some skin in the game, lest they lose their magical fortress. Your third option is you can house rule it. We can do similar things to what we talked about with the Amulet of the Plains earlier. Maybe the fortress can only be summoned once a day. Now the party has to decide if they want to use it as a weapon against a big bad evil guy or as protection in the night while they are in heavily werewolf territory or as a funny sort of mix of all of the above as a fourth option maybe the highly intelligent assassin stalks them for weeks when he finally confronts them he speaks the command word faster than the player using the item causing it to grow in a direction that he wants back towards the party, dealing 1d10 to the entire group of players and using up its one and only use for the day, calling for the rest of his companions now to burst forth from their hiding places to siege the fortress in the name of their Pasha. While it would be hilarious to see the look on your players' faces when you pull this on them, don't actually do this. This is definitely a DM versus the players, and it could cause some unneeded drama if you're not careful. Unless, of course, you have a beer and pretzels group and you're positive that they will laugh along with you, then go for it. Next up on this list is the Cloak of Invisibility. To be honest, this thing causes issues much akin to the Broom of Flying. It lets players skip encounters, which can be frustrating. While it would be nasty with the Rogue, I don't feel as though the Cloak's biggest issues actually come in combat. Just use creatures with Tremor Sense or Blind Sense or whatever on occasion, and otherwise deal with it in the fights. After all, you still have three to four other characters in the party not wearing invisibility cloaks that can be attacked and killed by enemies. But here's what I'll say about all all the story and non-combat encounters with this thing. One, invisibility is a second level spell in a world where magic users come in all shapes and sizes and things like wish spells exist. So it's quite reasonable for important places to be well guarded against many different types of things like assassins just teleporting into a king's bedroom at night or invisible assailants with boots of flying, gliding up to a bedroom ledge in a castle, etc. So I wouldn't necessarily give a player with just one of these a free pass to do any shenanigans that they want. However, I would suggest trying to come up with ways that you can guide a player to using it the way that you want it to be used. This is a dirty little dungeon master tip. What I mean is, if you give a player a cloak of invisibility, instead of putting it on the player to just come up with all of the terrible things that they can now do with it, instead give them a few gentle nudges to avoid them from wreaking havoc, like having an NPC hire them out to scout, spy, and infiltrate somewhere important, and lay out the groundwork for them. Tell the players up front with the NPC that 
These four places will be able to detect you or have any magic fields. How are you going to get around them? And create a scenario where your players can all be involved, not just the one with an invisibility cloak. After that, we have arguably the scariest thing in the world for dungeon masters to deal with, wishes. I'm talking ring of wishes, a 3D bottle, luck blade, etc. Easily the most terrifying thing for game masters to let the players get their hands on. I'll be honest here, there are 10,000 things that players might come up with and there's no way you can prepare for all of them. However, that doesn't mean we can't prepare for the one to three things that we know they're gonna wish for. Here is exactly how I would recommend handling wishes. One, don't restrict access to this in your game based off of the player's levels, but rather how many games you've ran or how far along the campaign is. Wishes have a chance to absolutely implode your campaign. I would not even consider it at the table until I was happy to have the game either end or go in a totally new direction. If I started the group at level 12, but we're only three sessions in, I wouldn't even consider giving them wishes. However, I might actually give players access to Wish at level eight if we've been playing in a campaign for a few months already. The second thing I would tell you is this, never just give your players wishes. What I mean is that an item that grants wishes should be foreshadowed. Players should know about an Afridi bottle and have to earn it in some form or fashion instead of just casually coming across something in a buried tomb. Even if your players do find one while they are exploring an ancient tomb or after defeating a big terrible boss, I would highly recommend that you hint at the item well in advance. You want them to be thinking about the item for several sessions. If you just drop it in their laps at the last moment, you're basically dropping a bazooka in the hands of a bunch of eight-year-olds, and I know you know exactly what the hell I'm talking about here. Let me give you a dirty little dungeon master trick here. What you do is hint at the fact that there may be an item that grants wishes a few sessions before your players find it. Then you shut up and you listen to them. What are they talking about? Are your players metagaming how they wanna use this thing? Are they talking about building a big base or sealing off the big bad boss in a three by three concrete block 200 miles under the surface? Just shut up and listen to them. While you might have a few blanks to fill in here, there's a likely chance that you'll start to get an idea based off of what your players say and what they will actually do with their wishes when they finally get their hands on them giving you an opportunity to think about story seeds moving forward. And then we come to our last campaign breaking magic item, which honestly I actually think is way more likely to break your campaign than even wishes. Uh, that's the deck of many things. So how do you keep this thing from breaking your campaign? You don't. Seriously, don't even try. That's not the point of the deck of many things. My advice, give this to players at a point in the campaign where you would be totally okay with the campaign either ending or going for another random three months, and then just hold your breath and see what happens. It can't break your campaign if there is no campaign, right? So now I'm gonna pass it over to you, the community. What magic items should have made this list? Have you ever had a magic item actually absolutely break your game, either as a player abusing it or as a DM? And finally, what would you wish for? Best three answers will be featured in a future video. I wanna stop for a moment here and sincerely say thank you to all of the amazing supporters that I've had become patrons from the $1 folk heroes all the way to you guys in our weekly Patreon Out of the Abyss campaign. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel. It matters to me, it matters to my family, and because of you, I can continue doing what I love to do. So if you've enjoyed this video and you wanna support more content like this, you can become an adventurer for yourself over at welcomeadventures.com where you can grab some extra goodies like monthly maps, etc. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I'd love to have you subscribe. Every week I put out new videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit that subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.